when we say this has a number, basically we say that means that this is the population that responds to this. And that has a probability that someone has exposed to Jews and clean shaven? Okay. Okay. Now that the 8% of people who don't have exposed to Jews, what's the probability that one of them has What's the probability that a randomly chosen male traveler in this airport has not exposed to shoes but happens to have a beard? Zero four. Obtain by taking the zero point eight and then find by the conditional probability that an explosive uh, passenger has a beard. And what's the probability that you find someone that has no explosives and no beard? Point seven six. So, given this sort of information for two events, the probability of one of the events and the conditional probability of the other event, given the chosen event and its complement, you can always fill out a table like this. This is complete information. Now, what does the trainer say? She says, I want to interview the traveler who has the highest probability of having explosive suits. So let me calculate the conditional probability given that someone has a beard, but that person has explosive suits. Is that the right number? Everyone agree with me? What is this? This is the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. What's the probability of A intersect B from our table? 0.12. And what's the probability of B? 0.16. Add this column. So we have enough information to calculate the probability of B and B complement. So she says, if I interview the person with the beard, the chance of finding someone with exposure to shoes is 3%. That's pretty good odd. If I think the other person, the other person, yeah. Um, you might think it's a happy ending. What actually happened, of course, was she did this, she was able to take patients and profile like a fire. But, uh, this was, I, I did find this in the most descriptive applications of national security, and this is one of them. And this is a nice example of a very generic type of problem. You could make hundreds of storylines up that work exactly the same way, and in every case, work out a table like this, and you get the right answer. And this is, in my opinion, probably the single most useful thing to know how to do with probability. Because it's easy, and most folks can't do it quite right, and the day, it's unfamous, basically, for inventing this idea. Before we take a break, have I got, I got 10 more minutes to do it? I got 10 more minutes to talk about this. This is an example from the textbook that shows that this sort of analysis can be extended to situations that are bigger than 2 by 2. And so we have a company that has a manufacturing plant in three um, factory towns named Farron. Henry, have you always had in common, anyone? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. Sure, sure. Yeah, all the work on And that uh, is um, is the and is also the and is also the electrical unit. I'm sure that the computer the computer the computer the 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 and finally, in Henry, 3,000 cars were manufactured, of which only 5% were effective. So, on the basis of that, we can fill in a table showing the probabilities of lots of different events that are deemed defective. For example, the probability of the event that intersects D, the car was made in Farad and was defective, is 1 6th. The fact that 1 6th of the cars were made in Farad multiplied by 1 5th, but the conditional probability of the car manufactured in Farad is defective. Notice all these are really conditional probabilities. The numbers only apply to give us some other event. This one is one third times one tenth, and this one is one half because the cars are made in Henry, and only one in twenty of them is effective. Uh, we can fill in the bottom row also. Oh, here's the unit: one sixth times four fifths, one third times nine tenths, and one half times nineteen twentieths. And that's what comes up with a number of interesting questions you can ask. You can ask many more questions when you've got six numbers rather than four, like. Hopefully, asked the dealer, which is kind of in Henry. And the dealer said, Sorry, I don't know exactly what it was made, but I know for sure it wasn't made in Henry. And you start asking yourself, Goodness, what is the conditional probability? Given that my car wasn't manufactured in Henry, but it was manufactured in Farad, the obvious answer is one third, and that's what calculation would give us, because that's the probability of the event Farad and not Henry, divided by the probability of not Henry. Now, this happens so frequently when you're analyzing this sort of situation. This is a super looking event. Farad intersects non Henry. What's the super way of writing that? It's just the probability that it was made in Tarot, because if it was made in Tarot, of course it wasn't made in Henry. So this is just the probability of made in Tarot over the probability of not made in Henry, and that turns out to be one six divided by one half, or one third. So this shows the point where they're getting us the obvious answers. Uh, I think that's a five minutes still for the remaining ones, I'm just going to make it then. Uh, so the next question you ask yourself is, given that my car was not made in this wonderfully careful plan in Henry, what is the probability that I have bought the letter? So let's formalize that. What is the probability of event D, my car is defective, Given event H complement, the car wasn't manufactured in Henry. This is, of course, the probability of D intersect H complement divided by the probability of H complement. The probability of H complement we know is one half. What's the numerator? What we have to add together to get the probability of this event? Well, we could have a Farad lemon or we could have a Gilbert lemon, right? So it's one thirtieth plus one thirtieth. Basically, we look at all the cars that 
were Beta Henry, and the fact that fraction of them were effective. In the textbook, this is done entirely in terms of counting, but I thought I'd do it in terms of probability. The analysis is entirely equivalent. The numbers in the book are the numbers I'm using multiplied by 6,000, but I might as well see it both ways. Okay, um, last pair of questions. What's the probability that I got a lemon? Well, the probability that I got a lemon is the sum of the probability that I got a lemonade in a lemonade in Gilbert, and a lemonade in Henry. So this is one thirtieth from here, plus another thirtieth from here, plus one over forty from here, and when we add that up, we get eleven over one hundred twenty. This is going to be the denominator in our conditional probability calculation, and usually when you do these conditional probability calculations, working out the denominator is the most tedious part of the calculation, because now we can answer the last question fairly easily. The drive the car away, and uh, after five miles it shuts down, it's towed into the dealer, it's repaired, it goes 10 miles and breaks down, and you reluctantly conclude that you have bought a lemon, and you ask yourself, what is the probability, given that the car has turned out to be defective, that it was made in Barrett? Now that one isn't really obvious, is it? You say Barrett makes a lot of bad cars, so it seems reasonable that uh, a defective car came from Barrett, but the answer is right, you have to use conditional probability. Probability made in Barrett, given defective, is the probability that a car is a defective Barrett car, divided by the probability that it's a defective car. What's the numerator of this? One thirtieth over 11, 1 20th, which is 4, 11. And if you want to do this in a more simple way, you just add up the number of defective cars and figure out what fraction of the remaining there. So it's not really that simple. Okay, let's take a short break and we're about to take for another hour. Thank you, Katie.